All right, welcome to the December 17th, 2020 meeting of the Arlington School Committee, our last meeting of the year. As people come in, I am gonna do our script. Um, this open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth through the outbreak of the COVID virus. In order to mitigate the transmission, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation. This meeting will feature public comment. In this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening via Zoom. It's posted on the town's website. All uh, that this, please note that this meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating via video conference. Please be aware others may be able to see you. Take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted unless I note otherwise. Um, the ground rules for our meeting. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, I will go down the list of members inviting each by name to provide comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer. Speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Um, for any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you. Um, and all votes taken in this meeting will be conducted via a roll call vote. So let's go ahead and um, do attendance before we get started. We have a lot of friends here with us tonight. So um, let's start with members of the committee. Ms. Exton? Here. Mr. Cardin? Here. Dr. Allison Ampey? Not yet. Uh, I don't think, oh, do we have two screens? Nope, okay. Um, Mr. Thielman? Here. Mr. Schlickman? Mr. Hayner. Here. Um, Dr. Bodie. Here. Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Mr. Mason. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Um, and I believe that Ms. Higgins is our rep tonight from the AEA. I'm sorry that I didn't reach out earlier. I'm not the rep. I'm actually uh, doing a presentation. Uh, Seif is here as the AEA rep. Super. Thank Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. We can hear you. Super. Um, Ms. Carmody is our student rep tonight. Okay. Um, Mr. Schlickman, I'm just going to check your audio because I missed you on the first round. Hello. Um, and then we have... Um, our elementary principals here, and I'm pulling up the list so that I don't mess this up because that would be embarrassing. So bear with me. I saw Mr. Dingman. Good evening, everyone. And Ms. Donato. Hi, everybody. And Mr. McEnany. Here. And Mr. Amadi. Good evening. And Dr. Hanna. Good evening, everyone. And Ms. Urchikov. Hello, everyone. And Ms. Peretz. Good evening. Super. All right. I think we have an oh, and I see Ms. Karustis. Hello. You guys are over two screens tonight, so this is really wild. Um, and Ms. Um, Satsoulis. Good evening. Uh, all right. I think that's it. Okay, um, super. So welcome, we're all here. We've done our script. Um, so the first um, item on the agenda is um, public comment. And I checked with Ms. Fitzgerald just before the meeting and nobody signed up for public comment tonight. So we're going to move to the next item on the agenda, which is um, uh, around a contract for Dr. Homan. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight to share that the school committee has reached an agreement with Dr. Elizabeth Homan to be our next superintendent. 
Um, we plan to vote on her contract tonight. Um, the negotiations were straightforward and collegial, and I've enjoyed working with her to bring this contract forward. In addition, we also have a contract for transition work to be completed between mid-February and June 30th of 2021. Dr. Homan will become our superintendent on July 1st. So the transition work agreement is critical. The committee believes strongly there's a lot that Dr. Bodhi will be able to share with Dr. Homan and that by affording them time to work together, we're supporting both Dr. Homan's success and Dr. Bodhi's legacy. So I'm grateful Arlington was able to attract a capable leader with a proven track record around curriculum development and community engagement. And we're fortunate that Dr. Homan has chosen to accept our offer. And I know that she's looking forward to the work ahead. And to our community, our Arlington Public Schools community, our teachers, staff, administrators, parents, caregivers, students, um, we very much appreciate your vested interest in her success here in Arlington. Um, Members on the town side have also extended a warm welcome to her and have shared their eagerness to work with and engage with her. So a strong relationship between town and schools is really critical. And it has been, that relationship has been fostered very successfully um, by Dr. Bodhi during her tenure. And I'm confident that will continue under Dr. Holman. So um, I'm gonna read this. So I would entertain a motion um, to enter into a three-year employment contract with Dr. Elizabeth Homan, appointing her as superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools for the period from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024, and authorizing the chair, me, <laughs> to sign that contract. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, discussion? Uh, Mr. Schickman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On this eighth and final day of Hanukkah, nine candles provide light at a time when the 415 sunset is much too early. It's also a good time to seek a bit of spiritual light. A Brooklyn College professor, Hershey H. Friedman, looks to the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud as paradigms for lessons in leadership. He writes the Talmudists believed that a colleague who disagreed with his study partner could be more valuable than one who tended to agree. Rabbi Haya Bar Abba illustrated this point 1800 years ago when he wrote even a father and son and teacher and student who study Torah at the same gate become enemies of each other, yet they do not leave from there until they come to love each other. We've reached this time to leave the gate. I cannot agree with my colleagues in making this vote. It is important that we acknowledge the debate and record our conclusions as a precursor to leaving our arguments at this place. Our agenda moves from deciding who will be our next superintendent toward the work of building a successful relationship with our new superintendent. The pandemic, the budget, and a plethora of other decisions on the horizon will provide us other interesting arguments to debate as we chart our future together. The Talmud reminds us that our one's best friends was a scholar one argued with the most. Even though we can't agree tonight, I'm grateful that I get to share this work with you, my friends. Thank you. All right, anybody else? I'm just making sure that we're all on, actually on this first screen. Seeing nobody, um, voting on the motion um, by Mr. Thielman, um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. No. Mr. Hayner. Yes. And I am also yes. And the second piece um, is I will entertain a motion to enter into a contract with Dr. Elizabeth Homan for transition work to be performed on or between February 22nd, 2021 and June 30th, 2021, not to exceed 15 eight hour days in the aggregate and um, directing me to sign the said agreement. So move. So motion by Mr. Hayner, second by Mr. Thielman. Discussion? I just want to say one thing is that this, you know, we set a goal early on of hiring the superintendent by December, uh, having her start onboarding and transition uh, 
him or him or her in, in the uh, you know February winter time frame, and uh, we have delivered. And I'm grateful to everyone on the uh, search committee, search process committee, screening committee for the work they did to get us to where we are today. Great. Anybody else? Seeing none, um, let's vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I am also yes. Okay, so congratulations, Dr. Holman. We're looking forward to working with you. Um, and thank you um, to Dr. Bodhi for all of your support and encouragement throughout this process. Um, it's meant a lot to me personally, especially, um, and I'm grateful. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And you've made this, um, you've made this really, really easy and rewarding for us. So thank you. Um, all right, the next motion, uh, next item on the agenda is the FY22 elementary budget needs. So we're gonna first hear from our elementary principals and then we are going to hear from um, the AEA. And so I guess I will turn it over to you. For those who are in attendance tonight, this is sort of the, the, the part of the process. I said this last week when we did secondary, this is sort of the easier part of the process, I think, because we come and we all say, oh, these are all such great ideas and we wanna do all of these things. And um, they're all very reasonable and they're all things that we need. Um, and then as we go into the darker, uh, colder winter months of January and February, heading into town meeting in April, um, we get to the harder conversations about what of these very reasonable, meaningful, and important asks for our students we will not be able to make happen given the constraints of our budget. Um, this is a particularly uncertain year. Um, I think that we all feel that as part of this process, um, concurrent with this, this this um, with these these meetings and what will happen in our regular school committee meetings, the budget subcommittee meets regularly during this time to go over some of these other um, important pieces and Mr. Mason um, and Dr. Bodhi are are really critical to um, keeping this whole process moving forward. So we spend a lot of time with them during these dark winter months. Um, and this is just the beginning of the process as we sift through the, um, the requests from the uh, elementary and secondary principals. So um, I will turn it over to you guys to let us know what you need. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, thank you, Chair Morgan. I'm going to um, uh, project the slide deck if you don't. Thank you. And I have the honor of starting this evening. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Paris, and I am the principal of Hardy Elementary School. Um, and I am entering into, or this is my third year here in Arlington. Um, and I'd like to first uh, introduce everyone who is here with us. Um, so Mark McEnany is the principal of the Bishop Elementary School, Stephanie Zerjikoff, Brackett Elementary School, Matt Ding Dingman, Dallin Elementary School, uh, Andrew Ahmadi is here from Pierce, Dr. Michael Hanna from Stratton, and Karen Donato from Thompson. And um, I would love to take a minute here just at the beginning to say thank you to all of these people um, for being such a wonderful uh, group to work with this year. Um, it has been a, a long and trying three, uh, few, I don't know, nine, 10 months going on now. Um, and they've been really wonderful to work with. And the thing that I'd love everyone to uh, remember at this point in time is that we did have, um, post, you know, before the pandemic began, um, some really wonderful goals that were in place um, and some great school improvement plans with those goals written in them. And I think that uh, the first thing to start with is just how honored we all are to be working in a district that really values education and really wants to support what's best for all of our students um, all the time. And in hard times, we know that that becomes even more important. Um, so if we look back, um, we want to tell this story a little bit about the budget. And if we go back to the beginning of 2019 and 2020, um, you might remember that we started that year with some really actually substantial investments into our elementary schools 
in the form of um, staffing in the areas of art, music, and physical education. To begin, that helped us to create some really wonderful schedules that in each one of our elementary schools helped us to um, think about adding additional times for teachers to work together with the building principals, um, coaches and district leadership in uh, an extra common planning time each week. It also created a predictable classroom schedule each day for our students K through five. It provided additional enrichment opportunities for students in K through three and art, music and PE and library and additional enrichment opportunities for students in grades four and five in digital literacy and chorus and in instrumental music. Those times that we added were called the ACE block times uh, and they were about assessment, collaboration and the use of evidence. And they really were very critical in helping us to establish um, this data culture that we live in right now and that we're trying to continue to move forward. Uh, we made a lot of progress from September to March. And so now as we think about the ACE block, it has been impacted um, because we don't have that time, that additional time in our schedule this year. But we would like to be able to keep the focus on that because the progress we made in order to be able to monitor um, the student's work and to be able to think about instructional plans that would support our students going forward have become even more important for us now. Thankfully, there were some other supports that were put into our budget last year that help us with these goals. Uh, we built assistant principals into two of our elementary schools last year. Uh, we added reading specialists, math interventionists, an elementary librarian and digital learning specialist and instructional coaches in science and social studies. And it's really very critical that we continue to support uh, these plans that we've put in place coming into the next year. Our students need these resources and they need us to create um, even more you know, targeted plans that will help to support and advance our student achievement in a way that is both equitable and responsible. Um, so that's the introduction that brings us to now, and I will pass it on to Andrew to continue the story. Good evening, members of the school committee, um, and, and to my colleagues, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this evening. Um, I'm Andrew, it is my, my first year in Arlington, and I feel extremely fortunate to be uh, the principal of Pierce Elementary. Um, I want to start again by um, sharing you know, you know some of the budget initiatives coming into this year that were recognized by school committee um, including additions of assistant principals in two schools supporting specialists both in reading and math um, adding an elementary librarian as well as instructional coaches uh, in both science and social studies and, and, and for that we're very thankful um, my sound's on right i've got my ear pods and i want to make sure okay cool we can um, hear yeah thank you thanks um, you know, this year has been unlike any any year, uh, which we're all aware of. Um, and I think we're all very hopeful that moving into 21-22, um, we will have a more normal normal sense of, of what normal is. Um, but I think, um, you know, speaking on behalf of the principals, we remain uh, concerned about equity in all forms, um, academic, social, emotional. And we're, we think through the lens of our, our, our most vulnerable populations students with disabilities, English, English language learners, um, those that are uh, uh, socially, uh, uh, socioeconomically impacted, students of color. And as we move into future years, notably next year, um, we really see um, a couple areas that we believe um, that, 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 the, that we could focus on um, in terms of additions to elementary schools. Um, first, um, you know, we believe that uh, having the opportunity to add reserve teachers um, based on enrollment, uh, particularly in grades K and one, um, are, are vital. We believe this because we anticipate some early literacy gaps in the lowest grades, uh, uh, potentially a larger um, early literacy gaps than uh, what principals would, would ordinarily see coming into schools. And we want to ensure that we have um, professional faculty with the prerequisite skills required uh, to be able to address those in our lowest grades so that students can come up to speed and up to grade level 
um, as quickly as possible so that they can um, access um, all grade level content and be fully immersed in all of the work that we do across um, our schools. Um, we think that um, it's, it's likely that enrollment in, in grades K and one may be more volatile than, than ordinary. Um, we know of families that um, you know, did not send their children to, to kindergarten this year, uh, perhaps others that have either held back or, or gone a different route of education for their youngest students. And so we anticipate that there is a, a high likelihood that our numbers in both of those grades could be higher than ordinary. And we wanna be prepared with, with professional faculty um, to do the work necessary for all those students. And I'd be remiss to, to, to not mention this evening um, the outstanding work that our educators have done um, in all of our schools, notably in, in the youngest grades. I, I think we are seeing some really outstanding work um, across our hybrid model, both in person and, uh, and online, as well as in the uh, remote academy. And so uh, we are extremely um, thankful and impressed with the work that our educators are doing. And we think that the addition of uh, reserve teachers in, in next year's budget can, can help support that. Um, the second ask that we that we have this evening for for school committee is to um, support full time assistant principals in all elementary schools. Um, this year has been challenging in many ways, um, but but one of them has been supporting both the um, outstanding curriculum uh, interventions and um, you know otherwise academic support that we want to give to all of our students and, and teachers. Uh, while also managing the, the logistical and managerial aspect of running a, a, a building with some pretty tight parameters. Um, and then of course, doing the work required um, with contact tracing and, 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 and that COVID-19 has required of us. And looking forward, um, you know, we, we expect, you know, like I said earlier, that things move to a more new normal. But I think it's important to recognize that the uh, logistical and operational work of all buildings will remain and, and to have um, only one administrator uh, in a building, uh, it, it's very difficult to bo do both the academic um, curricular work as well as the logistical management uh, operation that's required of uh, a building principal. Um, the need for instructional leadership um, was really important. Um, uh, prior to COVID-19, and we believe it'll be uh, more profound moving into the future. Uh, the need to support our teachers, the need to, um, you know, tweak and and um, um, implement curriculum in a, in a really meaningful way will require uh, strong leadership, and we want to make sure that we have uh, that set of leadership in each of, each of our schools. Um, we're really proud of the fact that across our schools, across grades, and across the district, um, our teachers work really closely with one another. Um, and we're very proud of the work that we do. And we believe that in order to relaunch schools um, with even more nuanced programming, uh, moving into next year and the years beyond, um, it will be vital to have um, two, two um, administrators in each of our elementary schools. I pulled some, some data um, and I'll just kind of go over the, the highlights. I believe they were shared in this evening's packet um, to, to give some idea of um, uh, across the Commonwealth, how administrators are deployed at the school level. Um, but across all K to five elementary schools, um, oh, thank you. Um, so the first table here is for elementary schools, K to five across the Commonwealth, um, schools with enrollment um, over 300, 70% uh, of them have at least one assistant principal. In K to five elementary schools with more than 450, almost 90% of schools have at least one assistant principal. For K to five elementary schools that are in the top 20% of the state, that's uh, a reference to achievement data, uh, where four of our seven um, elementary schools currently are um, those with 300 or more students, 63.3% have at least one assistant principal, and those with 450 or more have 85, um, 85% uh, actually 86% of them have at least one assistant principal. And if we move to the final section. Um, Again, these are all K to five, just K to five. Um, for schools that are in the top 10, 10% with respect to achievement data, um, which right, right now, as of 2019 data, uh, none of our elementary schools fell within. Um, schools with 300 or more students, 66% um, of them had at least a second administrator. And for schools with 450 students or more, 
uh, close to 94% of them um, had at least one AP. And so I want to include that data uh, this evening to, to offer a sense of kind of um, how, how building administrators at the school level um, kind of can be broken down for K-5 across the Commonwealth. And with that, that's what I have. I appreciate you listening to me and uh, uh, appreciate everyone's support. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Amadi and Ms. Perez, thanks so much for, for uh, uh, beginning this conversation. I want to recognize this team very quickly again, um, as both of my colleagues have, as an unusual group of collaborative school leaders. Um, I think that we be, sometimes take it for granted, the degree of collaboration, support, um, and real, uh, frankly, personal connection among all of the team members in this uh, principal group. And I uh, just think it's important for the, for the committee and, and for uh, uh, Dr. Bodhi as, as um, she's ending her tenure here in Arlington Public Schools uh, to be recognized as the facilitator and the, um, uh, the support that has led to this kind of collaborative teamwork. So um, there's many reasons to appreciate Dr. Bodhi's um, legacy. And I think that this uh, collaborative group is yet another uh, moment of that. Um, I'm just going to speak very briefly about uh, the, the final um, petition for consideration of, of uh, budget initiatives for 20, uh, FY22, and that would be the um, in one additional admin uh, beyond the uh, uh, assistant principals that Mr. Amadi had mentioned, which is a K through five coordinator of reading curriculum and instruction. Uh, the district has been um, along with many districts in the Commonwealth, taking another look at reading instruction, uh, recognizing the science of reading um, and reading development, and really, in, in my view, and I think the view of my colleagues, beginning to recognize the, uh, the linchpin of, of bringing all children to reading proficiency uh, across a school district. And in order to do that, it's necessary to uh, revisit, revise, and maybe even um, uh, rework um, our assessment and curriculum frameworks. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we really do need to have someone who is thinking about nothing else other than this uh, shift. Uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, uh, all of the K through two faculty across the district spent 90 minutes with uh, Dr. Melissa Orkin, who's an expert in the science of reading. I think all of them uh, walked away uh, having been uh, really uh, connected closely to the science of reading, but probably with lots of questions about what's next and, and the excitement from, from my faculty and I think others about what's next in shifting our thinking and our curriculum and our assessment frameworks uh, would really be possible in our view only if there were uh, someone leading that across the district uh, throughout uh, upcoming school years. Um, one of the, uh, uh, just to give a notion of what we mean by the science of reading, very briefly, um, uh, Dr. Orkin shared a, a quote from Steven Pinker about uh, just, just the, the newest um, and probably most insightful way of thinking about uh, the development of reading. Um, Mr. Pinker says, quote, children are wired for sound, but print is an optional accessory that must be painstakingly bolted on. What he meant by that, again, very briefly, I hope, but, but we did record Dr. Orkin's uh, presentation for anyone who'd like to take a, take a look, uh, that uh, students are, uh, when they enter, are very much languaged, uh, as we all know, in working with kindergarten students, they are ready to express themselves and use language, but the connection between that spoken word and that part of their brain that registers sound Connecting that to the part of the brain that sees things, namely letters and script, is quite a journey of neurology and it really needs to be done carefully and thoughtfully. We're so excited about learning uh, this uh, new set of insights, as again, many districts across the Commonwealth and across the nation are as well. Uh, but we, we feel that we very much need to have a colleague in this work uh, to lead it on a uh, really a daily basis, weekly, monthly, uh, to shift our instructional approach and our assessment approach accordingly. Um, so that, that's a little bit of, a, of the rationale for that particular piece of, of uh, budget initiatives. 
Um, again, uh, we probably did not spend as much time as, as uh, we should have at the beginning of the presentation. I know all of us would, would, would uh, like to express together our deep appreciation to the committee uh, for supporting our work, uh, not just in uh, budget initiatives, uh, but just in more informal ways and uh, throughout the process of this challenging shift to remote learning and hybrid learning. Um, we're grateful to be working with the uh, and for a committee and a, and a parent community that uh, so clearly supports our work uh, in, in Arlington Public Schools. So thank you very much for your time and um, uh, Chair Morgan, we'll, I'll then leave it to you to for any questions that, that uh, others would like to ask. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. I'm gonna be very quick um, and turn it over to Ms. Exton. My uh, husband has turned back on the clothes dryer and all of their snow clothes are bashing around in the background. So I'm gonna deal with that um, and give her a chance to ask her questions. Ms. Exton. Thanks, she's expecting me to have questions. Um, can you just share a little bit more about how the this reading coordinator would complement or work with the literacy coaches that are already the reading coaches that are already in place? Um, I'm going to begin, but I know that my friends will, will also uh, help to flesh that out a bit. Um, absolutely, the literacy coaches would be a component of of uh, the, the teamwork I can imagine that this coordinator would have. This coordinator would most definitely uh, be a coach to the coaches. Um, I think that uh, you know, we invited the coaches to Dr. Orkin's presentation yesterday. Um, they are so valued. We all, all we can think about, I think, when we think of our literacy coaches is having more of them. Um, they connect so effectively with our faculty. Many of them come from our faculty, our gen ed faculty. Their coaching of our reading programming up to this point, and then our uh, tier one instructional approach of uh, units of study is just fantastic. I mean, I've, I've got tons of stories. I know all of our principals do of how effective the coaches are. Um, but this shift is new for all of us. Um, it's, a, it's a new way of framing, especially early the, the teaching of the earliest and youngest readers. Um, I know that, that uh, Ms. Exxon, you have a, a particular awareness of that, of that shift yourself. And um, it, it is a, a challenging shift to imagine um, to say progress monitor students around uh, the degree to which they're uh, grasping uh, you know, nonsense words and what that would mean as opposed to uh, you know, uh, letter sound fluency, and that both of those things would mean very different uh, responses. And it's like, well, okay, well, we we know that that's that's uh, based on great research, but what does that mean in the classroom? I think that our coaches would be uh, essential to making this work, and I'd I'd look forward to an even deeper collaboration with them and with this uh, person leading them as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so my, my first question, I don't know if, if it's uh, Mr. Ahmadi uh, or whoever put the, together the data on the assistant principals. Um, I, I did try to try to look at that. I did try to look at that data um, a couple of years ago when we first started down the path <laughs> and it was a lot of manual work. So I was wondering what your source for this data was, this data set was. I contacted a representative at uh, Desi, who is a, um, a friend of mine, uh, to crunch the numbers. And it's public data. OK. Because um, what, I, what I did found, find was that you know, from, from our, I started with our peer, but we, we have a, an odd group of peer districts we call, which is more for town finance issues than for um, educational purposes. But there's this group called the Town Manager 12, which is in the area, but not towns like Lexington that superfund their schools um, or Concord that superfund their schools. Um, so I did try to look through those 12 communities and I found that several like in Needham, the principals aren't really full-time principals. They're um, like a special ed coordinator and a principal or they're part-time. And a couple of the other districts, the principals split between two schools. So each school does have an assistant principal, but they're split between two schools. So. Um, I, I don't know if that's captured in the data you have or, 
or if you want to comment on that. Um, well, I, I didn't specifically look at the, I believe they're called Town Manager 12. What, what I did is just look at the more, more broad data, K to five across the state, and looked more at um, performance data, uh, mm -hmm. both in the top 10 percentile, top 20 percent, uh, top 10 percent, top 20 percent, and then more generally K to five. Uh, and, and I and I debated bringing more um, data disaggregated by K to eight, K to five, K to two, pre K to five, but thought that the most succinct um, way I could present this evening um, would be on only K to five. But I, I would be happy to but do the additional work um, to look specifically at the town town manager five and the models and percentages there as well. Okay, and I, I don't think I don't think we need to do that, but I, I do think. Um, uh, you know, particularly for the, the schools that are under 400, I don't think it's quite so clear. I, I'm surprised at the 70% figure there. Um, maybe maybe if you count part-time assistant principals, yes. But um, uh, I, again, the, at the data set I looked at, the, the very small schools did not have full-time assistant principals. So I'm a little surprised by that. Um, I think, you know, I, you know we, we've, we've heard the case for this before. Um, and I'm sympathetic to it. Um, you know, the original five-year plan we put together called for a half-time assistant principal at, at, at six of the schools. Um, and, and I think we were convinced that that was a reasonable place to start. Um, I think where, we, where we've added full-time principals, um, particularly at the Stratton where there's an SLC, um, that makes sense. But this is, you know, and the, the you know, we we did see it at the budget subcommittee a, a cost uh, analysis for this, and it's almost a half a million dollars initiative, which is what we spent on the ACE block. So I think as we, you know, prioritize and go forward as a team, um, not just you, but as a whole administrative team, first, I'm not sure it's so fair to invest that amount of money at the elementary level that where we are where we've already in, invested that amount last year. And second, I just don't know that full time at every school is is really going to be a priority compared to the other things you're asking for. That's more of a comment than a question. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you. Uh, I was wondering how these asks relate to your multi year plan. Um, and was just it feels like the the reading coordinator wasn't on the the uh, horizon at all. So I'm I'm just wondering how are you? I mean, are are we done with the multi year plan or or what's happening? Um, Ms. Peretz, um, I'd be happy to talk to that. Uh, so I think there's a piece of this that is an adjustment to the plan because of what's happened most recently um, with our school closure and remote learning and COVID-19 and the impact that it's had um, on our children and the community. Um, but it's also just a, a, a support and a continuation of plans, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that we've had already. And I think that it's connected to the assistant principals as well because that investment of the time and the structure that we put in place with the ACE blocks is something that's going to be really important for us to continue to um, move forward in a way that makes sense. So uh, to paint a picture just a little bit with that time, that ACE block time, our schools that had um, someone else who was a partner to the principal to be able to support that work were more successful in moving that initiative forward. So for example, at Hardy, um, I was able to really take the time to sit down with teams of teachers, um, with coaches, with other district leadership at meetings and not be interrupted and be able to create agendas and spend time focusing on the people in front of me, looking at the data and working on that culture in which we are looking at trends, um, looking at the information that came from assessment, you know, adjusting our curriculum in order to make plans for our students and target the needs of our students. Other colleagues maybe did not have the luxury of being able to sit down at that table because as they tried to sit down at that table, there were a lot of interruptions for the day. Um, it's a very, very busy place in elementary school, um, as many of you well know. 
And I think that being able to have more eyes on it, to have more team members ready to help and support that work, help to make that investment pay off for our kids. And I think that we made great progress in that, and that now it's even more urgent that we keep that work going forward. And the more and more we learn about reading specifically, as Dr. Hannah um, so nicely expressed, is it, it, it becomes a, a very big task. Um, and we need, with seven elementary schools, someone who is going to help to coordinate those efforts, especially if the building principal is being asked to be the manager of all. So I'd ask you just to keep that in mind as you consider the requests. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, just Can my I just understand. Dr. Trampy, I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted to add one thing to that, just to, um, to build on um, what Kate just shared. I think also uh, you know, we're absolutely committed to the process of um, developing five-year plans and you know, responsibly uh, allocating the resources from the town to our schools. I think we also at the same time have an ethical responsibility to pay close attention to the trends that are happening nationally and statewide. Um, uh, early literacy is a um, very big topic for educators in our state right now from a state level you know, down to a school level and also pay attention to where those initiatives are affecting the achievement of our students. Um, and it is not a new conversation for us to be looking at uh, data starting in third grade that's telling us that it doesn't seem like, based on the populations that we serve, the amount of students that are reaching proficient um, are matching what we're seeing um, or should be seeing or would like to be seeing. Um, and, and then as we disaggregate, we're noticing that there are populations of students that are disproportionately affected um, within that data. Um, you know, certainly students who are identified special education, um, black and brown populations, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged. And I think our responsibility is to do something with that data in a timely way. So um, I, the, I, I guess I'm just sort of pointing out the iterative, iterative nature of what we do that's hard to capture in a five-year plan. And um, so I hope that makes sense too, of you know, why some of these asks may be more responsive to the moment that we're in than where we were when we created that first draft a few years back. I guess one question I have about the role of assistant principal is my understanding was that the principal was the one person in the school that could basically do anything um, and not be in violation contract or, or anything. Is assistant principal, are they able to do the same or is it more circumscribed in terms of what their, their job responsibilities can be? Dr. Hannah, um, Dr. Bodhi. Yeah, oh, please. Dr. Dr. Bodhi, go ahead. Uh, the assistant principals in our district are members of the uh, AAA Administrative Union. Um, having said that, uh, we work, they're part of our team. And I have to tell you, our assistant principals, as well as all of our curriculum leaders, work very hard. And uh, together. So I, I'm, I may be misinterpreting your question, but I'm assuming that you were thinking maybe about hours or... No, 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 no. 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 About yes, actual... They are very long, they work very long hours. Not questioning hours, questioning job responsibilities that my understanding was the principal can pick up and do anything that needs to be done. Whether or not they should be doing it isn't a different question, but they can, and it's not in violation of anything. And I'm just wondering if the assistant principals have the same carte blanche or if they're, I mean, as you say, they're in the AAA and does that make their, the things that they can do less open? I would say no. Um, I don't know if Rob is looking to answer. Um, they can, and their job description is very, um, very broad. And basically, there's one stipulation that they would, um, you know, attend to any task that the principal uh, gave them. So it's very mm -hmm. broad. They are evaluators in our in our evaluation system. In some cases, they may have uh, 
they're a secondary evaluator. In some cases, they may be a principal. So that has not been our experience. And I'm assuming that uh, Dr. Hanna was going to say something similar to that. But you may even have more detail you'd like to, to, to give. Um, Mr. Spiegel, did you have anything to add to Dr. Bodie's and then we'll go to- I was gonna say they, you know, our assistant principals can supervise and evaluate staff. Um, they do, their work year's a little different because they have a 205 day uh, work year while the principals have full year contracts. Um, I think in some schools, um, the assistant principals tend to be more focused on operations and the principal is more focused on instructional leadership, but that is not probably, uh, there's probably some crossover. I, there's, they both do some of each or a lot of each. So that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hanna. Uh, if Dr. Allison Ampy is happy with that response, I don't need to flesh that out any further. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the presentation. I just want to say that I support assistant principals. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, we'll see where the conversation goes at the full school committee level and the budget presented to us. But my, 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 my understanding has always been the principal stands for principal teacher. And in order to be the principal teacher in the building, you have to be <clears throat> um, talking to teachers, uh, looking at that, you have to be the lead instructor in the building. And so I think uh, this has been a need in our district for a long time. Uh, it's And as our school buildings have gotten fuller with more kids, uh, this has become a more glaring need. So I I think this is a very important and I support it. Um, <clears throat> and I realize the town manager 12 may be all over the place, but um, you folks are in the schools running them every day. And uh, I, I I support, I really support this. I think this is a good, a good initiative. I also am glad to see that you have, uh, you're thinking about reserve positions in the budget. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a lot of clarity about when we, we adopt this budget, usually I guess in March and then it goes to town meeting in April and there still won't be a lot, there'll be a lot of, I think, open questions that uh, we'll have to answer over the summer. So I'm glad that's in there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, I really don't have any questions, but I do want to say I support the assistant principals, and I also want to thank um, you for your work uh, in operating this, the hybrid model um, during uh, this time. I think you're setting an example for uh, other districts and um, all, all schools in our district. So only have a comment, no questions, but thanks for all your work, and yes to assistant principals. Keep advocating for them. I, I agree. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. First, in terms of the data that uh, was collected, the state has increased the amount of data they're asking from districts uh, every year. So that it's not a surprise that it's easier to collect it now because they're collecting very detailed staffing data, uh, including the function, the site, uh, name and licensure, and they, they're collecting the master schedule so that you're able to uh, tie on the state level, which teacher was with which student. So with the depth of uh, data going to the state, it's easier to get go to the state and call back that data and make those comparisons. And I'm thankful for uh, uh, the work that was done uh, by our principals to collect that as a comparison. Um, of course, it depends on how accurate the state uh, uh, reporting is. I want to concur with my friend, Mr. Thielman, about assistant principals. And the one thing that we've learned going back a few years when we have changed the evaluation procedure for teachers, that this has become far more labor intensive and it requires a lot more interaction time with the evaluator and, and the teacher so that uh, th there is only so many hours in the day for a principal to do a job and to be doing the job of supervising and evaluating staff and running the building uh, is, is a huge conflict. Uh, and as our schools have gotten bigger, the need for assistant principals has gotten larger as well. Um, the question I wanna ask is that the secondary principals were talking about social workers. 
in that the social workers were essentially allocated to serve primarily or exclusively special ed students. Uh, and I want to ask the question of the elementary principals, are, are social workers able to interact with and serve the needs of struggling students who don't have an IEP? If not, how are they being served? And if they're not being served well, is this a recommendation? Mr. Dingman? I'll be, I'll be brief because I, I bet other people want to chime in on this too, but um, I, the, I, I think about every day when I'm going in the building and you know, my different limbs, you know, my teachers and, mm -hmm. you know, are that, that one limb that um, I know is going to meet the needs of, uh, you, know, you know, all our kids from the second they walk in the door to the moment they leave. I think about um, Ms. Carustis, the assistant principal and the roles that she's going to play throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, in support of whatever's in front of us for kids, for teachers, for you know, managerial um, tasks and facility work. Mm -hmm. And then one of those, probably multiple limbs, I, may, I might be more like an octopus, are these social workers in our buildings who um, are uh, really more and more become central to the operations of schools. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously this year's a little different because we have um, less students in front of us, but they're you know, they're still as active as ever. And I think mm -hmm. that's gonna, you know, obviously be um, a big part of what we have to deal with in the fall. Um, as important as they are, and I would say the quick answer to your question from my perspective is, is yes. Um, it's always, um, we always wish that we had more time, more opportunity, more interaction, but our social workers are, uh, we've made a priority to make them available to all kids and have a process of working closely mm -hmm. with our teachers to understand who needs more of, of their time, um, and we work uh, as a team. I think Ms. Carustis mm -hmm. would agree with that, that our social workers, myself, her, we're a team and how we work with kids. The other thing that they do is they push all of us to be social workers at heart. So along with you know, great, great initiatives in making social emotional learning a priority for classrooms and a PD for teachers, we, you know, we operate in a way that has everybody thinking and acting a little bit like a social worker. So it's that influence um, in an elementary school, it makes them, you know, their leadership and their work with kids so central. So I know that kind of spanned off a little bit, but um, I just, I love, I love what we're creating with um, these licensed social workers in our schools. I'm sure my colleagues can jump in on that too. Uh, Mr. McEnany. Yeah, uh, good evening. And, and in addition to this year, I mean, although we only have like a third of our students in our buildings, our social workers are supporting all of our students who are in the remote academy. And that has become uh, pretty expensive and uh, frankly overwhelming for our social workers to try to come up with uh, interventions and connection points with these students who are having, although they are in the remote setting, are still having uh, uh, challenges accessing um, you know, curriculum or just accessing the remote uh, platform. So, you know, these are families that just have chosen to keep their kids out because of health reasons or whatever their values are uh, to keep them at home. And um, as we uh, continue to move forward to look at every student and, and their needs, um, uh, Sarah Bird um, has been working with the schools and have sent out uh, surveys to assess where our kids are at. Um, uh, as far as their mental health and those interventions and that family outreach um, that um, um, in response to those surveys um, are extremely important. So we don't want to, you know, do things just to do them. We need to have action plans and, uh, you know, a path forward in supporting our kids. And as we continue to uh, conduct surveys and to look at every student, uh, the needs of our social workers are, are are integral to our programming on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Peretz? I'd like to just add to that too, that you know, there's a short answer to the question as well, which is that at least at Hardy, almost 100% of the time of our social worker is taken up servicing IEP minutes. Um, and so when the time does come to support others, which she does. And we always work together as teams to find times to make sure that she's paying attention to those needs 
of any student at our school, um, it, it becomes very stressful and trying because she's missing, whenever she's doing something for someone else, she's missing something that she needs to be doing for others. And so I guess I would ask that as we think about this idea of the reserve teacher, that we broaden that idea of what that means for us when we start to see what happens to our enrollment coming into the next year. That instead of just keeping that focus on classroom teachers, that really it's about keeping the ratio between the services and the different employees that we have within our buildings that have serve different functions in mind. Um, we also are really spending quite a lot of time um, thinking about an MTSS structure, which is that multi-tiered system of supports. And I think that's really what Mr. Dingman was talking about and, and Mr. McEnany was referencing also is that we all wear many, many hats. And when we're trying to meet the social emotional needs of our kids, it's, it's not always necessarily the social worker who needs to do that, is that there are a lot of wonderful people in the building who can build strong relationships and meet needs for children. So we do a lot with um, a very limited amount of time, but the social worker is clearly a critical member of that team. And if I could just do a quick follow up on that, uh, looking at going into the 2021-22 school year, uh, as we're bringing the school back together and putting the pieces back together that we uh, disassembled last March, uh, I'm wondering what short-term needs would exist to meet the needs of students, both academically and social, emotional learning, uh, as we're recovering from the diaspora and recreating our school communities. Mr. Amati. So, uh, Mr. Schlickman, I, I, I appreciate the question. And, and I think one of the ways I tend to think through this is to continue to support with our social workers, the social emotional needs of our students. But I think one of the ways that we can do that uh, and just to kind of bring it full circle is if it, with full-time assistant principals, assistant principals can, can support uh, the social workers because the social workers in my assessment really ought to be working with the students um, to the extent possible throughout the school day. But assistant principals can be supportive, uh, things like contacting families, um, you know, kind of the, the logistical work about partnering both, both the social worker and the student and with the families to be able to take some of the back end work off of the, the social worker so that they can focus their, um, all of their time within the school day uh, with students that they serve. Dr. Hanna. And Mr. Zuckman, another anticipation of what will be urgent in our uh, reassembly uh, is to uh, quickly and effectively assess uh, students in all ways, um, both their academic readiness and their social emotional well being, um, and to try to maintain as much as possible the, uh, again, kind of circling back to a budget ask. Uh, the uh, smallest number of, of the smallest size cohorts possible. Uh, and that's not just simply classroom teachers uh, to reduce class size. I know that there's plenty of research to talk about the relative effectiveness of, of general education class size. But we deliberately kept um, uh, open the precise targets for additional staffing, professional staffing, because we're going to let those assessments um, lead our uh, uh, employment decisions. Uh, we may very well find out, um, as we've just been discussing in another context, that the math struggles of our students uh, seem to be uh, more acute than we had anticipated. If that holds then, we could anticipate that additional staffing would need to be deployed uh, for math instruction, whether that's uh, more interventionists and tutors or actual uh, teachers of math, additional math coaches. So we'd like to, to find out exactly where our kids are at and then deploy uh, resources to buoy uh, the areas that are necessary.
Um, Mr. Schiffman, are you done? You're still on mute. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Um, when I first came on the committee, uh, the school, the Arlington School Department had uh, cut an awful lot of staff and we were starting to climb out. And in the past nine years, we've done a good job of trying to fix all the things that had to be cut. The one area, and I applaud your recognition and the need for reading and the support of it. What I don't know, what I don't understand is why I have not heard to get full-time certified librarians back. Their job is not only the selection of books and dissemination of books, but is to foster a love of reading in a professional way, to support the faculty in all the academic areas of providing resources and supporting the faculty and teaching themselves, doing the teaching themselves on research and aiding and bringing a love of reading going forward. You get a student that likes to read and looks forward to read, you're nine, nine tenths of the way there in remediating any of the issues that they might have. Uh, I would, I could, I have no problem supporting a reading person that you've asked for, but not until we get full-time certified librarians back. We do not fund our libraries at the elementary level. We depend on, on support from PTOs. There's no coordination of the books in those libraries from one school to the other in the support of it. And uh, I, I, I think that's a tragedy. We're one of the few, I, I don't know of any other school uh, of our size that doesn't have that as a regular thing. I was appalled that they were cut originally. I understood something had to happen, but we've made no, and this is not a reflection on the people that you have running your libraries. I think they go way above. They do a phenomenal job and I would support them becoming certified, but we need to get that, that, that piece there to support our teachers in a professional way, instead of adding another administrator. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Peretz. I'd like to add just one quick positive thing in response to that. I know, I know that wasn't a question, but um, Jennifer Lachlan has done an amazing job working with our library pairs to look at the collection and find other ways to be able to access the library. So I think that really was a wonderful addition last year and we've used that resource quite a lot. But there's no coordination throughout the district. There's no budget for purchasing books. There's no regular curricula aspect of inclusion within all the uh, academics. Uh, and that and this is not a reflection on you folks. It's not. A, it's a, it, to me, it's a reflection on the district and its priorities. And I see this being a, a way to uh, right from the beginning. That child that walks into the kindergarten. We have a lot of highly educated parents in this district that support reading. That's great. But some of our kids don't have that. The only place they're gonna get it is in school. And I see it as a, a beginning and a, a way to help a lot of the issues going forward. I mean it positively. I, don't, I apologize if it comes off critical. I think I'd like to just see more going into that. Dr. McNeil. I just, I just uh, Mr. Hainer, I just wanna just, I want to correct one bit of fact of information so that the public knows that we have made great strides this year. Building off of what um, Ms. Peretz has said, uh, we've had uh, Stacy Kitsis, who has worked very uh, closely with Jennifer Lachlan, and they have, and, and along with the principals, to begin to curate the various collections across the um, district in order to bring them. Uh, into alignment. And also we did, uh, Mr. Mason can correct me if I'm wrong, add a line item in the operational budget to support uh, various, the purchase of uh, books um, to add to our collections. And we have actually focused on books that have SEL themes and multicultural authors and main characters. So I do, I do want to talk about that we've made some progress in that area and not leave the public thinking that we have not done that with the addition of Ms. Lachlan this year. Ben, I ask how much money is in the budget to purchase books? Yes, I can answer that if the chair would let me. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. <clears throat> yeah, so this year we 
funded each school at five thousand dollars, and um, per, um, and that was going to be a continuous um, funding. So it will be again, hopefully, provided in the next year's budget as well. Um, is, unless does that include the middle needed. schools? All schools. So it was a fifty thousand dollar set aside. The only place we have a certified librarian is at the high school, and that's required in order to maintain our certification. No, no we, uh, Jennifer Lachlan is a certified librarian at the elementary level, and we hired her, uh, and she began working this past year. Let me ask you, do you think that is sufficient to meet the, 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 the do you know of any other district that, treat, that does this at the elementary level? Well, I can't speak to other districts, but we do, if you look at the five-year plan, our, in the five-year plan, our, our, our goal was to add more uh, certified librarians throughout the years in order to build up that capacity. Is there, any, is there anything in the budget this year requesting an, a, another or part-time certified librarian for the elementary? Mr. Mason? So, um, all of the, the five-year plan is still in effect. We haven't moved away from that. So anything that's part of that plan is, is actually a request for this year. There might be different priorities due to this unprecedented year from closing where we have to realign the priorities, but all of the requests are still intact. But I, let me just drill down. Is there a request for a li at least one more elementary librarian, certified librarian? Or is there just X oh, amount of money that will let, be prioritized? Let, let, let me also, uh, there's this kind of nuanced. Um, so our, our, in our five-year plan for this year, uh, we were supposed to hire two certified librarians at the elementary level. Unfortunately, uh, the pool of candidates was not up to our expectation. So we are very lucky to hire Jennifer Lachlan. She's extremely uh, knowledgeable, and has a very high level of a, a high level, a high skill set, not only in um, in library science but also in technology. Mm -hmm. And so she's able to assist with uh, our technology specialists and and work very intimately with her as it relates to you know making that connection and and really evolving the traditional library or traditional profile of a library into more of like a, a multimedia. Um, That's the current certification coming out of the schools. It's a dual me? certification, technology and library. I agree with you. We're fortunate to have that. We're very fortunate to have Jennifer. And, and when we were trying to hire additional people that had that type of skill set, we weren't able to do that because to be honest with you, that is, you know, it's very difficult. So you have to have a, a definitely a pool of candidates. So instead of hiring another, and because we didn't want to just take that position and and not try to think of a way to, you know, utilize, you know, what you approved to our advantage, we hired uh, Robin Peasley, uh, elementary technology specialist. And so we kind of expedited that because that plan to hire more technology specialists at the elementary level, we we were trying to do that as well. So we hired Robin Peasley and Jennifer Lachlan for this year, and then the goal was to um, work. We were going to work with Stacy Kitsis, who has different relationships with the other um, with um, library science programs. You know, the different undergraduate programs within uh, you know Massachusetts, and leverage that relationship in order to identify, you know, uh, and recruit, you know, highly qualified candidates to fulfill that position. Simmons, Simmons College uh, original library science degree is now library t science right. technology. Well, that, was an, that was another issue because not, not a lot of teacher preparation programs, it's not, you know, it's not a, you can't take that for granted that all teacher preparation uh, programs or universities have a library science uh, program. So that's also, you know, adds to the uh, challenge for trying to fulfill this position. So is we, this current budget currently have a request similar to what you just said for this year? 
Well, it's in the five-year plan. We haven't we haven't seen that we haven't seen the full request, Bill. This is the request from the elementary principals. Correct. It's it's so in it's the five-year plan to add on. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. I'm sorry, I cut you. Go ahead. No, I mean, so it's appropriate <laughs> to ask the principals if they still think a librarian is a priority or not. But I think the question as to whether it's in the budget is premature because the budget has has not been put together yet. Uh, then I, I take Mr. Cardin's uh, direction. I would ask the, the each one of the, if you had the ability to hire a certified librarian for your building, would you do so? Let me put it that way. Let me put it as a hypothetical. Anybody want to say that they don't want a certified librarian in Fine. their thing? I know <laughs> if you're that. given the money to buy one, anybody, any takers? Sorry, does anybody no, want, I can to accept that want to answer Mr. Hainer's question? No takers now. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> I mean, yes. we want, we would like that. But I mean, I also would like more social workers. Like there's a lot of things that I think that we, you know, because we are very sensitive to being responsible financially as well. And so I think that, you know, as we come forward, we're thinking about the best ways to move our programming forward to best serve our, our students and our community, so. I think we can all agree that the earliest we can intervene with any type of learning issue, the best, it serves us better. And the, to me, a, a certified, qualified librarian, we talked about it before, and I appreciate Dr. McNeil and everyone else putting this in the five-year plan, is a way to deal with a lot of reading issues. Not all of them, but it is. Thank you. Um, so I just, I want to, um, I, was, I was actually also gonna ask about the librarians just because of where we're at. Um, in the five-year plan, right? And we were hoping to do seven over five years and we got a little behind because of some hiring. We punted one a year forward. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're just falling, you know, we're falling a little, but we're falling a little behind of where we wanted um, to be with that. So, um, but I did see it was, um, I was actually sort of scrambling because I think that it was on the list, Mr. Mason, that we had yesterday. I'm conflating two meetings. Is that right? Was it, on, it was on that list, I think, that we had yesterday, the digital media specialist for elementary? No? No, I, it, it, it was not. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, it was not. I feel I, like I've seen it somewhere on a list, but maybe. So, so can I clarify? Please. So I think what you're, what, and Dr. McNeil highlighted it, is that we did have it approved in the budget this year. So the school committee approved the positions this year where we just didn't fill it yet. And that's, and we would continue to hold that position as we go into the next year as well. So there is still the intention of hiring and remaining on track in that way. And then we'll look at the five-year plan to make sure if there's any other requests in the current year to see if that would make it to be included in the 22 budget or the 23 budget, whatever that. Okay, because okay. where we should have been based on the five-year plan in FY22 is we should have been at four. And what I'm hearing is, is that we have two-ish, like we're counting the second one, which is fine. Um, we have space for a third. And then the question would be, do we add a fourth for this year to stay on track with what we had, you know, we had hoped to be able to do before FY24, or do we hold that back as a request um, this year. So I think that seems to be still pending, which is, is fine. Um, I, I shared Ms. Exton's question. I was reconciling the literacy coach that's in the five-year plan with the coordinator of reading curriculum and instruction. Um, so that conversation was, was helpful for me. Um, the piece, and this may be even more appropriate for Ms. Elmer, and I, I, we talked about this last year too, that the expanded inclusion programming at the elementary level was called out um, this year, as well as um, an increase in SLC staffing. We didn't do, I don't think the inclusion came up last year, but the increase in SLC staffing, I know I asked about last year and Ms. Elmer said, we're, we're okay, we don't need it right now. Um, so that's why we're not asking for it, but I was curious about, um, about how we're doing with that. Ms. Elmer, do you wanna take that one? 
Sure, yeah, so we will be, um, and Mr. Mason, I don't know if he'll share with you in subcommittee or whatnot, um, the SLCC, which you asked about specifically last year, um, because of the age, ran age range, we were able to condense that to one class last year. Um, next year, that age span will increase beyond what's allowable and we will be going back to two classrooms. So there will be um, an increase for the SLCC um, because it will be splitting back to a K2, 3, 5 model. Okay, but that's, that's, that's what is needed right now. Yes, so that will be an ask for this year. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Mason? Yes, and just to, just to clarify, because I know that we spoke yesterday in a subcommittee meeting, these, there were, as we were going through the process, like Allison just mentioned, there's still more asked being added to the list. So um, that was a few of them I will update the subcommittee on. Great, yeah, tis the season, let's ask away, right? Let's get the whole list, bring it all down, get it all in a sheet. I love a good chart, Mr. Mason, nobody makes one like him. They're always pretty, always have lots of nice headers. And, uh, and away we go. All right, great. Anybody else um, on the elementary uh, budget asks from the principals before we hear from the AEA? Okay, seeing nobody. Uh, Ms. Higgins. Thank you, good evening. Um, thank you for letting me present this evening on the FY22 budget for the elementary teachers. Um, we actually have three requests only. Um, and the requests are based around being ready to, to provide for the students um, returning after the, the pandemic world. Um, and we're hopeful that will happen next fall. Um, children are gonna require additional support. So I think that a lot of the conversations have already occurred um, about the need for the social work support. So um, first I will be specific about keeping class sizes low. So the teachers have the time to give extra attention to all the students. So we're asking that teaching positions that have uh, been put in place and TAs this year are, are retained for next year. Um, and we also anticipate a surge in students re-entering for the 21-22 school year. Um, adding more detail to the additional interventionists are going to be absolutely necessary, uh, social work especially, but also reading, speech, math interventionists, OTPT, and special education in general. These teachers are already overwhelmed with students and we need to be prepared for an increased need for these services next year. Additional staff in these areas will enable us to address any learning gaps that teachers identify <clears throat> due to the challenges of this year. It will also allow more scheduling flexibility, which may be needed as students are identified for interventions throughout the school year. And finally, we are advocating that money be reserved for staff salary increases. I believe we can all agree that our teachers have been doing the impossible this year. The workload has tripled and our teachers have worked tirelessly to provide students with a quality education. Many hybrid teachers remark that it feels like they are working three jobs preparing for two different groups of students. Remote Academy teachers have had to completely redesign their curriculum and work to engage learners in a new virtual format. Arlington elementary teachers are doing amazing work to teach and reach all students. And these heroes are worthy of a salary increase next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Um, from the committee, sorry, for us, I don't know. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I, 
I guess if you could, um, uh, the fact that the assistant principals did not come up on your list, is, is that significant or um, is it just a reflection that it wasn't something that you happened to, to discuss with your members? So when we polled our members, um, these were the three high priority areas. But as I was listening to the elementary principals, you know, I really applaud them in all of their asks because they're all going to directly influence our jobs and, you know, the ability <clears throat> for us to have an administrator available, more available to us. Is, it would be wonderful. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Heiner. I guess my question is uh, from uh, Dr. McNeil and uh, uh, Mr. Mason with regard to some of the asks that Ms. Higgins asked for and some of the principles, uh, the, the positions dealing with the issues resulting from the pandemic and stuff like that. Would these be one or two year positions? And, you know, we would not be, would we be looking to make, keep these people after, after we get back to whatever normal is? Um, I, I, okay. I, 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 I wouldn't be able to, I think it's, it would be premature to answer that question at this moment. Um, I think that, you know, every, through the budget development process, we are evaluating the needs of the district. And I think that the positions that we add are, I see it as temporary positions and that's how I track them. But I think that there's a opportunity for all of the, the leadership to kind of look at the roles to see if we still need the roles going forward, even beyond the pandemic. So I, I can't say for definite, for sure, is it, a, is it a, can be a continuous position beyond the pandemic or, but um, I think that would be up for consideration when it's time to look at the budget. And, and okay, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. McNeil. Did you have something? I'll, I'll yield to Dr. Bodie. Dr. Bodie, you're on mute. Thank you. I'm sure Dr. McNeil also has some um, to add to this. We share we share Ms. Higgins' view on this that next year it's going to be very important um, as we have students coming back from the remote academy who've been remote since uh, last March. We also have students who right now are, have very small classes. And our average class size in the, in the elementary schools in, in past years has been close to 23 students. We certainly would prefer not to go above that um, with the surge. One constraint I know the committee is aware of is the number of classrooms that exist in each school. And in some schools, that is more constrained than in others. So we are going to work with, um, together as a team and with the teachers to think about how we're going to address this issue as we uh, look at next year. And uh, to the extent that we might have to add classrooms, that is going to be within the constraint of a particular building. Um, so we agree. We agree that we need to have more support for students next year than probably we've ever had. And uh, to the extent that we can provide that, we want to provide that. Dr. McNeil, you might have something else to add to that. No, I, I, I echo everything that you just said. I think it's going to take us, you know, we're collecting data this year. We're looking at, you know, literacy data, math data. And I think that going we're trying to be proactive and then moving forward, we'll have to continue to have these conversations involve our teachers and in order to understand what the needs are beyond this year into the next year, because some of the effects of this year, if you read any article or research, it's going to, you know, they're, they're predicting it's gonna be three to five years for us to be able to really address the learning loss that some of our students have um, endured due to the pandemic. I want to make it clear, I am in support of the things that, for just the reasons both you and Dr. Bodhi have put. Mr. Mason answered my question up the front. He said he's, he's listing them as temporary at this time to be revisited in the future. Thank you. 
Great. Anybody else for uh, Mr. Thielman? Yeah, I, I, I um, see some, I see alignment between the AA's uh, request and the, and the principal's request. I mean, if you think about an assistant principal, an assistant principal can alleviate pressure on, uh, on other administrators, other staff in the building. Um, and uh, so, I, and, and, you know, we all want to get class sizes, parents, student, uh, teachers want to get class sizes as low as possible. I don't think anyone is opposed to that. We are limited by space um, and budget. And so one way to address that actually is, is with an assistant principal who can take on some duties the principal uh, was doing, can support teachers, can support teachers who might need additional uh, instructional pedagogical support. So I actually think there's a there's an alignment, at least in in theory or in spirit, I guess, in spirit between what uh, Ms. Higgins is advocating for and what the principals have advocated for. So that's- Can I just- yeah, Go ahead, Dr. McNeil. Thank you. I just wanna also add on the fact that we don't know what next fall is going to look like. Like we, we know that a vaccine is coming out but we don't know its effect. We don't know how many people in the, in the communities are going to take the vaccine. So we really, at this particular point in time, it's unknown of what the um, learning environment will look like you know, uh, in the fall. So I just wanna add that, that we have, you know, we have definitely high hopes that we'll be able to be back in school full time with students learning every day, as if we, you know, pre-pandemic, but we, it's, that's still a, a, a question mark. Right, anybody else? On that uplifting note. <laughs> um, you're not wrong, um, it, it's appropriate to be cautious. Um, thank you, Ms. Higgins for coming and for sharing these with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, so that wraps up our uh, elementary budget ask uh, portion of the evening. Um, we're so appreciative that all of you uh, came to see us. Often this is one of the few times that we see all of the elementary principals together each year um, on the sixth floor. And But we've spent so much time with all y'all all summer and all fall that this just feels like another meeting. So this was great. Um, and I appreciate um, that we were able to get through this and the depth of questions that my colleagues were um, asking was appropriate. Uh, Dr. Bodhi. Um, I would just want to say uh, that I invite all the elementary principals to leave the meetings they so choose. Um, we, and this might be an appropriate time to say why. We are, we are reopening schools tomorrow at the regular time. And I know that all of them uh, have a lot to do to prepare for tomorrow. So if they leave, I want you to understand why that's the case. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you. I saw a lot of our assistant principals here as well. Yes, so thank you so much. It was it was great to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, um, so the next item on our agenda is um, Dr. Bodie's evaluation from the 2019 2020 school year. Oh dear, I've just moved all you guys over. Hang on. Um, so just a second. Hang on. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is uh, I, I provided our evaluations to Dr. Bodhi. I created a compilation um, with the, um, the scores that people gave um, around the, uh, in the various areas. So I wanted to give members of the committee an opportunity if they uh, wanted to, to share their general comments from the, um, from the evaluation. Um, so, it is, and you wanna raise your hand if you would like to do that. I plan on sharing mine. So if that takes the pressure off of you or makes you more inclined to share, um, either is fine. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you, sure. 
Um, so this is just the blurb that I wrote. Um, I would like to commend the superintendent on a year of superlative effort under extremely difficult conditions. For the purposes of this evaluation, I am including the first few months of the 2021 school year in addition to 1920. And these past 12 months have been some of the most difficult times for our schools and our community. The superintendent has worked diligently to ensure a safe, equitable education for our students, despite the ongoing pandemic and its associated challenges. The fact that we were able to reach an understanding with our teachers union this fall without strikes or votes or no, of no confidence is a testament to the strong collaborative relationship with our staff, which he has fostered over the past 10 years. While there are things over the past year that could have been improved, I feel they have already been noted and work is being done towards their solution. The effects of her hard work are also seen in the Arlington High School building project, which continues forward on time and under budget despite the pandemic. Again, I commend the superintendent for continuously driving our district towards excellence by her personal example of hard work, dedication, and care for our children and staff. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Shookman? Thank you. I recognize that at this point of the meeting, because it's the evaluative document, we can only read what we have written and not offer any other commentary. Uh, but I will read my, uh, my uh, commentary from the evaluation. In many ways, this is a bittersweet evaluation to write as Dr. Bowdy is now in her last year as our superintendent. It has also been a difficult year as the pandemic has required an extraordinary effort to keep up with the virus and state standards for responding to it. Dr. Bodie's leadership working with the superintendents from neighboring districts was decisive and correct when she decided to close the schools before the state made the decision for the rest of the state. In retrospect, we learned that February, the February Biogen Conference at the Marriott Long Wharf was a super spreader event. This resulted in the virus entering Arlington significantly earlier than it did in most places in the United States. And I credit the work of Superintendent Bodie, her colleagues and surrounding districts, and the town's health officials for their leadership last March. The pandemic challenges traditional methods of evaluating student performance. MCAS data is unavailable, and many initiatives ground to a halt when schools are closed. While hard data is unavailable, the district's work has been thoughtful and deliberate. Work on the new high school has been commendable. Going forward, students will feel Superintendent Bodie's influence throughout the building for the next half century. The new high school will be the capstone of a career in which Dr. Bodie is leaving the district in a much better position than she found it. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Morgan. So I'm just like Mr. Schlickman, I'm gonna follow the rules here. Uh, here are my comments. The 2019-20 school year was an extraordinary one. It marked the first time in 100 years in which schools had to close because of a pandemic. I don't think any public school district was prepared for such a challenge. And in March, when we went remote, Dr. Bodhi kept her cool, stayed on top of the impact of the pandemic, served as a leader among a group of superintendents trying to figure out the direction to take, and ultimately kept our kids and, sa and staff safe. She listened to multiple ideas from stakeholders about how to proceed, and found ways to create the best online experience possible for our kids between March and June of 2020. The evidence and report of the school committee shows that she and the district met the goal of identifying, diagnosing, and intervening early and effectively with elementary students not reading a benchmark at the end of grade three. I gave Dr. Bodie a rating of, of exceeded on her professional practice goal because that goal involved meeting with teachers, administrators, and other stakeholders to address all issues related to the construction of our new high school. Dr. Bodie worked nights, weekends, and throughout the day on this project. She set the strategy that led to the preschool opening in September at the Parmenter School, ensured the site was safe for students and staff, and played a hugely important role in guiding the building committee as we wrestled with the, with the value engineering process that was made all the more difficult by unforeseen challenges with the site, including the inability to use ge geothermal heat. Time and time again, the building committee and design team looked to Dr. Bodie for guidance on seemingly minute details of the project and she responded under deadline and pressure with measured and reasoned solutions. Quite simply, the project would not be where it is today, very close to on time and under budget, 
uh, with a well-informed community without Dr. Bodie's leadership. One of her many legacies in Arlington will be our new high school. Thank you. All right, anybody else? So uh, I, I wrote this um, a couple of days ago, so it actually, it doesn't, it feels a little weirder to read it now, but uh, it, it is fitting that I was, I was writing this narrative on the same day that I drove down Massachusetts Avenue and I saw the steel beams of the new high school begin to outline the building's skeleton. Dr. Bodhi has guided and led this project from an ethereal idea to a place where it is literally rising from the dirt. While the ribbon cutting will happen under the tenure of a new superintendent, this building is something that she will always share with the Arlington community. And we should be deeply grateful to her for her stewardship of it through many iterations and phases. There is no one who has been more faithful than Dr. Bodhi, that this building will come to fruition for our students. It is fitting that we are able to evaluate her for her work on the high school project as her professional practice goal for this last year. So the um, overall rating um, of proficient and uh, uh, rating of exceeded for professional practice and met for student learning. So it, the evaluation is a very formal process, which doesn't work very well for me because I like to sort of speak and say what I think um, at the time. But um, I really appreciate the members of the committee taking time to uh, do this evaluation uh, thoughtfully. Um, and um, I thank Ms. Fitzgerald for helping me put it together. So um, Ms. Exton. Can I just... Um the uh in step two the 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 sums of ratings don't match and so i just want someone to double check oh okay so they're not seven six seven. so so for standard three yeah um i am i allowed to i mean am i allowed to publicly say what yeah <laughs> Okay, so I gave a rating of needs improvement, but it's not marked there okay. for students. So I probably um, put it in the wrong column. So I'll go back and check that and make sure that it's right. Yeah, before we, um, before it's totally done. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other comments on the evaluation? All right, seeing none. Let's move to the end of year report. End of year 2020 report. This is a little, well, yeah, okay, great. Uh, Mr. Mason. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so this report I, I, uh, I sent, you, uh, sent to the school committee about a month ago. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you had time to, to review it. Uh, and this report was submitted um, on time to the to Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, this report, as you may know, is required, one of the required reports uh, um, that reports on all expenditures related to education here in Arlington. So it's not necessarily just for Arlington Public Schools. Um, but the report uh, was drafted by myself and the school accountant. So I do want to acknowledge Jose Farias for his work as uh, this was his first ever doing this end of year report. Um, and as well, I want to thank the town controller for uh, helping us review and tying it out because it's, it's, it's a very, um, very important report. Um, and as uh, Paul Slickman had mentioned earlier about all the data that they're collecting from the state, you know, this is one of the data points and how they tie everything together. So um, the total expenditures reported in FY for, for FY20 um, is, was $112 million over $112 million. And that's, uh, if you compare that to the previous year, which was fiscal 19, which was slightly over $103 million. So um, the difference between the two years was about nine and a half million dollars um, from all spending. Um, so uh, about 9.3%. And of that slightly over half of that sp uh, spent comes from the school committee uh, appropriation. So which was of, of $69 million. Um, this uh, did not include the prepaid uh, expenditure for tuition that's related to fiscal 21, 
Um, if you remember, we, we prepaid about $1.3 million in fiscal 20 that was related to uh, fiscal 21, which is this current fiscal year's uh, special ed out of district placement spending, um, which we're allowed to do by mass general laws. Um, the, town, the town spending increased by over 6 million uh, to the amount of uh, $32 million of expenditures. Uh, and so most of those expenditures are tied to the, the shared resources between the school and the town and capital related expenditures, um, such as uh, like the capital projects like the high school vehicle acquisitions and uh, large expenditures for student and teacher devices. Um, and once again, that main increase over the prior year as the high school, as the high school is ramping up, more expenditures are actually related that are getting reported for the, for the project. Some, some takeaways from this year's report. Um, we did meet net school spending, um, of course, well over it. Uh, required net school spending was $62 million, a little bit over $62 million. And the district spent of eligible uh, net school spending um, to, uh, type of expenses was about $84 million. So we overspent by $22 million. Um, total instruction related costs was $56 million, um, 50, over $56 million. Um, we increased our instructional spending by 6.69% from the prior year, that which was at $52.9 million. Um, pupil transportation increased. That was one of the larger increases, but it wasn't too substantial. It was 1.5% um, from $1,829,000 to $1,857,000. Um, our operational costs uh, increased by 13.56%. That would include things from IT, transportation, facilities, um, from 5.4 to 6.1 million. Um, um, I'm sorry, that was, I'm sorry, that was actually facilities related. That was the big change. And then our payments to other, sc um, other schools for like special education outside district placement did decrease that was a substantial change from uh, 6 million to uh, um, 5.7. Um, so I, may, I know many of you may have time to review this already, but uh, I open it up to any questions. I, I'll leave it to the chair to determine any questions that anybody may have. Absolutely, questions? Okay. All right, put everybody right. to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just clear, Mr. Mason. We're all, oh, Dr. Allison Ampey coming in late. What do you got? No, I, I wasn't actually asking a question. That's, um, but I just wanted to say I do actually appreciate your summary, and and um, I think it's also good for our listening public, which sometimes now is larger than we normally have, um, to hear this too. So thank you, so. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just add that I, I appreciate the analysis as well. It, it's This is one of the more complicated reports that the state requires because it includes the funding from the town side, which we don't normally talk about. It includes debt service, which we never talk about. Um, so it includes, uh, I think, regional tuition for Minuteman, which isn't yeah. part of Arlington, so Arlington and um, public schools. So it's a bit of an odd uh, report. Um, it's required and I'm glad we do it every year and, and, and I'm glad you, you pull out some of the highlights, but it's uh, not, a, not a particularly useful report from my view. Thanks. Not useful, but very well done. <laughs> I would say it's useful for town people in the town to see it, not maybe not for school committee discussions. That's my take on it. All right, any more uh, conversation about the usefulness of this report? Mr. Schlickman. Well, in, in many ways, this is very useful because when you go to the state website and look for the town by town comparisons, uh, this is what it's drawing from. So that you have a foundation of an understanding of Arlington before you go and start making comparisons to the uh, town manager 12 districts or to other communities that you're looking at. So to have this data as reported to the state with the state reporting codes 
uh, attached to it and the funding sources is, is really an important tool to have for us. And, and I'm very appreciative of, of uh, having it shared with the committee and the community. Thank you. Mr. Carden. Uh, but Mr. Mason, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my understanding is so when we talk about the per pupil spending amount, that's a different report. They pull out different things. They, this is the data that feeds that report, but it doesn't include the debt service. It doesn't include Minuteman, for example. Is that correct? Um, I'm, I don't believe that those, there are certain items that are not included. And I don't believe that the items that you just spoke about are included in the per pupil spending, but they, it, it, it does get pulled in different ways right. to show that the, what districts are investing in their schools and their buildings and whatnot. So. Exactly. Thank you. All right. Anybody else on the uh, end of year report? Not to be confused with the next item on the agenda, which is the monthly report. Mr. Mason. Yes, yes. So also, uh, so the report that was for your review tonight was um, all the expenditures uh, as of November 30th um, in a projection. Um, so the reports are the same format as you normally would see it. Um, and uh, this once again is from July 1 to November 30th for the general fund, the grants and the special revenue of revolving funds. Um, the general fund report is the school committee appropriation. Uh, that's the, the, the funds that the town provide. Um, and you'll see that as of November 30th, we, we spent about $21.1 million. Um, and this is about in line of what we're, where we were last year, where we were around about $20.8 million, if you were to look at a report from last year. Um, as well, we have about $52.1 million in encumbrances at this moment, um, which is actually more than where we were at last year. Um, but tied to that is some tuition that we normally would encumber directly from Circuit Breaker that we are going to do a transfer to Circuit Breaker this year, which is slightly different than what we've done in the past. Um, so that may show a reflected of a lower amount of projected expenditures of $668,000. Um, the projected expenses uh, use a formula that just assumes that all departments will spend their departmental budgets and uh, the projections do not include any anticipated expenses for additional staffing needs or any additional staffing that might have been um, hired recently um, after the particular date of November 30th. And um, that would also include any staffing that might uh, be needed for the reopening of the high school um, uh, when that time comes. Um, or anything that's been identified as additional expenditures for instruction that they may need, um, as well as any other transitional support um, that I think was discussed this evening, um, those kind of projections are not included. Um, it also does not reflect uh, any facilities related needs um, in the sense of uh, some things that are above and beyond that we can anticipate or any ventilation uh, repairs or maintenance that may be needed um, due to this time. And, you know, as you may know that the, some of the, the Corona relief funds, coronavirus relief funds are coming to an end at the end of this month. Um, and, you know, so the general fund appropriation will definitely be uh, taking a, uh, maybe taking a hit for the additional expenditures. Um, to relate it to uh, addressing COVID or like the sanitization materials that we've been uh, using in part of our, our, our plan for reopening. Um, so uh, also where there might be um, some additional, as, as I uh, think about additional uh, expenses that might need to be covered from specific revolving funds due to the reduction of revenue. Um, and um, we also may need to consider if we're gonna prepay special education again this year, um, but um, if there's an appetite for that. Uh, so I say that all to say that the $2.6 million does not necessarily reflect a final surplus and that uh, the, 
this can change actually based on the needs that I just discussed or anything that I may have missed out. Um, also, uh, to move on from the general fund report, the grants report is, is, as always, the grants report. The drawdowns are happening after monthly reconciliations. Spending plans are happening as expected. The special revenue and revolving funds, uh, most of them are, are holding strong, but we do have to, we're, we're monitoring them. Uh, we're, we definitely are seeing decline in revenue of many of our programs, um, some because due to decrease in participation or just because of fewer offers, offerings being offered. Um, in some cases, in those cases, the expense cor are, is correlating to that decline as well. Um, so, but we might have to think about, like, you know, some programs that are struggling. I've heard feedback from even outside vendors of the after school programs that, you know, that are in our buildings, they're, they're taking losses because of, of the pandemic and the, the participation rate being lower. And that's the same for our, even our internal program. Um, um, and also, you know, I did the edit didn't make it to the, to this round of the report, which I, I I apologize, which is the reduction of revenue for the building rentals of the Pierce Field, since there's actually no uh, current outside use of our facilities except for the after school programs that are outside vendors providing support to our students for after school. Um, and then, um, the final report you'll see is the report that I've been trying to share with you all is just the COVID expenditures report, um, which is all the expenditures that I've known for uh, that are tied to COVID, which now we're showing a $2.9 million total expenditures for both FY20 and when you consider FY20 expenditures for the, at the end of the year and FY21 expenditures for this current year as of November 30th. But what I do want you to know is that um, the CVRF funds, those are the relief funds that were a part of the CARES funding that for the schools and for reopening and all of the funds have been accounted for. We did make a final amendment um, to those this month to adjust for the different needs that we, we needed and that we were gonna place on the grant and we'll be doing that final claim uh, in the, by the claiming period deadline. Um, and that's, that's it for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, questions from the committee? Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey? Um, just a sec, I have to bring this back up. I was checking something. I was just wondering if you feel like power, um, electric power is running within, I mean, do you feel like what you've encumbered and, and or, or projected in expenses um, will cover it or are you anticipating that it's going to be higher yet because we're not that far i mean we're just getting into the cold season and stuff good question good question so um currently i mean as you see you'll see in a report that we're around two hundred sixty four thousand dollars of expenditures at, uh and we were you know, Ken Pruitt, the energy manager, he does projections for us. Um, and we were going to land around slightly under $900,000 for uh, electricity usage. And that included a model that um, included the, 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 the increase in usage this year due to the ventilation systems. And that in, incorporated that and then incorporated the credits that we were, were getting from other um, programs that we're trying we take advantage of such as the credits that we get for some of the, the um, panels on our roofs and so um, I believe right now that we're in a good good standing we are most of our heat is, our heat is not provided through electricity um, and I think that due to some of the buildings not being fully used currently um, um, we are seeing some savings so we'll, we'll keep monitoring that and I believe that the additional 173 that's set aside to meet that projection that Ken Pruitt talk, uh, spoke about that we may need is, um, you know, we'll make sure that we'll have that set aside when it's time, if it's needed. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, so my question, Mr. Mason, is right now it's, it's we're showing an available budget of 2.7 million roughly 
Um, and I'm just wondering if, <clears throat> are you anticipating that we're gonna get to the end of the year uh, without using that money or are you, are you, so can you just talk a little bit about that, what you're, what you're thinking about in terms of that surplus? Yeah, so, um, well, A, we, we're not 100% sure what some, some of the expenditures that we're going to need. Um, I don't think that that 2.6 million is going to be there towards the end of the year. Um, you'll, you can probably look at some budget line items on the report. I mean, we had a snowstorm today, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know what kind of winter we're gonna have this year. Um, if you think about from 2015, it was uh, a horrible uh, winter that year and substantial uh, expenses a lot of districts faced. So um, I, I can't speak on acts of God. Um, I, we're still trying to develop um, um, our understanding of all the needs that the high school is going to need for reopening. Um, we've been working closely with Matt Jenger on that. So once I get more information on that, I'll provide that in the projection model. Um, and I think that there's still hiring that's happening that will also adjust these projections. So um, what I think we should take away from this is that uh, we got additional $1.3 million this year. We prepaid $1.3 million, right? So that could clearly explain that, but at the same time, understand that, um, you know, if, if we don't spend all of these funds, we, we might consider, we might, we should go back to consider, should we do another prepayment, especially when we don't know uh, the funding yet, but that's kind of premature at this time. I, I do think that, um, and, and Kathy might want to add some more based on some of the, her knowledge in the, of the matter, but I, 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 I'm just very hesitant to speak of, to say that that $2.6 million is free right now, freed up to use for something else. Thank you. Dr. Bodie, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think Mr. Mason explained it quite well, but we do have some uncertainties. We always have uncertainties with the building. And one of the things that's been true this year is that we do not have um, rental income, which has been often a source of paying for these. We have other programs that also, for example, um, uh, our our international students, we do not have any this year. So uh, it's hard to know. <laughs> We've had the elevator at the high school have some hiccups. I don't know what that could mean. So we hope we will have a, a surplus at the end of the year uh, because I think that one way that we can help our, our, our budget for next year is to, is to go into uh, the FY22 in a stronger position than we would if we didn't uh, prepay tuition. So um, I think every month we'll monitor this. And I, as you can see in the, the spreadsheet, we've had two, we've had two storms and uh, we're already, we've had some low snow years and so that budget reflects it, but that could change around this year. That's just one thing. Yeah. One thing I just wanted, I, I probably should have asked this offline, but I just asked while we're on call now is that um, I, we have not spent the $100,000 that we're gonna spend on air conditioners um, in Fusco House. Is, is, it, is it possible to use some of this money for that if we have to? Uh, so, Kathy, you, if I could answer this, I'm not sure if you wanted to answer it, but I, what I typically would like to do when I look at the budget is, you know, instruction always goes first, right? Yeah, I, yeah. And, and then what, what we do is there's a period at the, towards the end of the year where we cut all the departments off from spending when we know that there's not much a chance of sn all unforeseen events to happen. We look at what's available and then we ask what the facilities department needs and or IT or any other department to then reallocate the resources to them at that particular time frame, similar to what we did last year. So to answer your question is, is that I don't to, I don't think I don't see a problem why we wouldn't use that as an option towards the end of the year, but we Good. need to make it, make it 
make it to that point. Because that would just slide $100,000 back into the high school building project. Right. Right? Good thing. It, yeah, it was yeah. a good thing. Oh, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I just thank you for following my whole line of questions there. Thank, thank you. you. All right, anybody else on the monthly report? Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I I just wanna comment on the uh, prepayment of uh, out of district expenses and uh, the possibility of putting money into the uh, reserve fund for, for special ed for next year. Cause I think that the one thing we need to be alert for uh, is uh, a funding drop for next year from the state at the very least because of the reduced enrollment this year and much of our chapter 70 increases has been fueled by an enrollment increase. So uh, I, I, I remain nervous and would be appreciative of any effort we can to uh, prepay items that will ease the pressure on us for next year. All right, anybody else? Seeing none, um, the next item on our agenda is the school budget analyst job description for approval. Um, Mr. Mason, do you wanna share that with us? Or Dr. Bodie, do you wanna share that with us? I can. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Kathy, do you want, I, didn't, I don't know if she said something on me. Okay, um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, I would like today to present the the but the present to the committee the budget analyst position that would be added to the business office team. Um, so from the start of my tenure in Arlington Public Schools, uh, I've worked with a team of individuals that are very capable. Um, however, I I noticed especially during the pandemic that there is a capacity issue in the business office, and after reviewing the responsibilities of you know the current members and the department, the roles of the department are very siloed. And um, it is such that when there's a leave, like the, even recently, you know, the operations has to stop. And so I, I, that's not acceptable, especially for a vital department in the district, because um, we need to always keep going. And over the years, um, you know, I've been looking at the, you know, the, the workloads and the, the funding, the the office has acquired additional responsibilities um, and such as increasing accounts payable duties, including the, even the, the, the accounts payable for the Arlington High School project and all the related um, documentation to that, um, which, you know, there are certain reports that we got to report to the US Census Bureau and we should have the capacity to track and have a document um, tracking system to, to prepare for closeout uh, of that project when it happens in you know the years down the road to proactively uh, instead of you know trying to be reactive to that and trying to do that towards the end and you know also there's the need for additional uh, responsibilities for the student activities accounts that uh, monitoring and um, um, we're doing reconciliation but there's you know which will come out later on there's nothing wrong with what's going on with in terms of fraudulent activities with the student activity account, but there's additional oversight that will be needed and that the business office will be stepping in to do and to streamline the, the processes to that. And um, this position would support that. And, you know, as we've modernized uh, different workflows in the business office um, and throughout the district, um, such as, uh, as recall, there was a, a management letter uh, for the switch of uh, a manual process of procurement to electronic process. But when we do those transitions, um, there's also, there's, there's a lot of headaches to those transitions. And there was never really a look at the, the, if the, the, the capacity of being able to handle that throughout the district while you decentralize that process, what it would, what it would mean to the departments and the support that the business office can, can pro provide to those departments as well as the additional ability to just provide um, the, uh, the, some analyzation ability in, in the sense of providing that support so we can provide a trends or even, even additional information to this committee. Um, 
to this, to, that's what the business office is for, is to support the instructional and administrative teams better and uh, to also support uh, any requests that you know, uh, the superintendent of the school committee needs. So that's what the goal is for the, adding this position in the business office. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Just to, for my understanding, you're looking for us to approve the job description and uh, the salary range, am I correct? Correct. Because we have no control over any contract once we've, we've done those two things. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and then Mr. Cardin. Um, I just wanted to say that this position was discussed yesterday at budget and uh, a motion was made and passed to recommend to the full school committee that we accept um, and we accept the, we agree with the, <laughs> with the request for the um, position and we think it's a good idea. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Yes, as I said uh, yesterday at budget, it's a, I think this is a very important position for us to have, um, both for uh, uh, covering um, any absences that, that occur. It's a very thinly staffed office to begin with. Um, and as a committee, we need more, you know, we're, we're always asking for more data. <laughs> and it's it's just Michael and, and, and Jose that, that, have, that are around to produce it. And that's not enough um, because he, he's, as a CFO, he shouldn't be working with spreadsheets quite so much, even though I know you love spreadsheets, Michael. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I'm very supportive of the position. One, one quick question, Michael, though, is, is the salary for this already encumbered in that, that budget we just looked at, or would this be um, an additional cost that's not already accounted for? No, this is not included. So that would be an additional staffing need that would be added, well, reduced from the balance of the surplus. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. I move approval of the school budget analyst job description. Second. Uh, discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton. Oh, sorry, Mr. Schlickman, did you want to talk about it? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I also agree this is necessary. I'm just wondering uh, in, in the marketplace, is the salary range going to get us the person we want? Mr. Mason. So um, the, the salary range is very sensitive um, in the sense of it's very complicated. So I do believe that we'll find the skills uh, person that the skill set that we need um, with the salary range, but at the same time, uh, mindful that we're at slots between di the different personnel that's already in the on the team already. Yeah, that's it's just, you, you're just playing in an area that's not my uh, area of expertise. I don't know what the uh, going rate is for, for these kind of positions. Uh, thanks for doing the work and analysis. I look forward to the yes vote. Uh, other discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, all right, Mr. Mason. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Appreciate the support. Uh, Dr. Bodie, superintendent's report. Um, well, the first thing is saying again that tomorrow all of our schools will be uh, starting uh, at regular time. The high school, of course, will remain a remote. Um, I also want to thank um, all of you for your comments, uh, particularly around two things. Uh, the work that was done this year to make sure that we have safe uh, schools that we could make sure that all of our students um, would be getting the kind of programming that we know they need and, and they deserve to have. But I also have to recognize that this work is really quite a team effort and many of the people are still here at the meeting tonight who are on that, but you also heard from the elementary principals. And I would include beyond that, all the other principals and curriculum leaders. It's a highly collaborative, uh, hardworking group of people. And um, I, I think that Arlington is very fortunate 
to have this team of people. And uh, it is something that I know that the new superintendent uh, will enjoy working with all these people. Uh, and the other thing is the high school. I mean, this has been a labor of love for quite a long time. This goes back many, many years, really. Um, and it really is a thrill to see it going up. And I, I'm, there's a part of me that very much misses the idea that I will not see it all the way to the conclusion. But um, I will be driving down Mass Ave a, every once in a while just to see how it's going. Um, and I have no doubt with this building committee that we have that it's going to be done on time and continue to be under budget. It's really a terrific building committee. And uh, we, we've hired the right people uh, in, in terms of our architects, our contractor and our OPM to do this. Um, so it's, tr it's really terrific. And I hope I get invited to the ribbon cuttings. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so uh, with respect to uh, the building, if you drive down the street, you're going to see changes all the time. Um, looking out of, you know, I have sort of a bird's eye view. I think Mr. Mason has even probably one of the best views of what's taking place every day. But it's really exciting to see at this point. Um, and it's going to continue as we, as we move along. Uh, there's still a lot of planning meetings that continue behind the scenes not to mention the building committees, but I'm thinking of some of the subcommittees that are existing, that exist. And some of that work is gonna really ramp up in the next few months as we look at technology needs and all of the other, the interior aspects of the building. So um, one of the things I would encourage people who are listening tonight um, I don't know how many that are there, I mean, not, not too many, but I will encourage them in my next newsletter to, uh, you know, go to the uh, ahsbuilding.org site because there, there are some great videos and you're up to date with all that's going on with the project. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Kirsty Allison Ampey and Amy Spear, who is not here tonight, or for their work to make sure that website is up to date and terrifically organized. Um, so I have one more thing and that is um, our athletic report for the fall season. We, our kids, besides the fact that I know they really loved being together as we've talked about before, they did, some of the teams, they all did very well. Uh, but some of our teams actually um, were Middlesex League division champions. Um, and I will start first with the boys vars varsity cross country team record was four and one. They were the 2020 um, Middlesex League division champions. And they have a number of, and by the way, it's the third one in the last four years. So they had a lot of league all-stars, which I will put in the newsletter as well, but not read them tonight. Um, the girls, uh, the girls cross country team did well. They have some league all-stars. Varsity hockey um, has also league all-stars. The uh, golf team have league all-stars. And uh, the varsity, um, the boys varsity soccer team were the Middlesex League Division co-champions. And in addition to that, one of the players um, is not only an Eastern Mid uh, Massachusetts All-Star, he is an All-State All-Star, and that is Eric uh, Wadrick. Widrick, I'm sorry, Widrick. And then the girls varsity soccer team, um, they have an all-state um, champion as well, and that's Claire Ewan. So I will put all of these um, in the newsletter so everyone can have a chance to um, uh, read it and appreciate 
the uh, the um, the great work of our of our student athletes. So that's my my report for tonight. Uh, Ms. Elmer, thank you, Dr. Bodie. Ms. Elmer. Sure. I just I just wanted to add. Sorry, Dr. Bodie, I didn't get this to you before um, you had your list for your report. Um, okay. I just want. Last week, we sent out a notification uh, to the entire school community. Um, it's posted on our website, and it also went out in the public notices that in January, we will have our on-site um, tier-focused monitoring, which is formerly known as coordinated program review. If you recall, the DESE um, reviews comes on site every six years, but every three years, there's a mid-cycle review. So this is now called TFM cycle B. So we're in that mid cycle. Um, this is primarily um, civil rights that they'll be reviewing and it's more policies and procedures, but they will also be um, observing facilities remotely, <laughs> looking at floor plans to see locations, rooms, and they will be interviewing staff as well as families. So um, they send questionnaires to every parent uh, of a student with an IEP, but then they, there's also an opportunity that if you go to the special ed webpage or you go to the CPAC um, new Facebook page, there is, if you want to be interviewed, you can um, call directly to them, do not call to our office um, to get on a list to be interviewed for that as well. Um, so I just wanted to let the community know about that. And that'll be in January, uh, the week of the 18th. Thank you. Um, and we'll continue to put that out for the public to know uh, that information. Uh, but as we are, um, just one last comment, and that is as we are ending 2020 very soon, um, I really do want to also acknowledge besides the, the administrative team, our teachers, and Ms. Higgins talked about this tonight, but I, I want to also say and, and, and publicly appreciate again, um, and it can't be said enough, as how hard our teachers have been working. And, um, and what is also remarkable is that we've had a number of situations uh, where teachers have had to, at eight o'clock at night, find out that the next day they're working remotely due to a COVID case and close contact. And they've done it beautifully and seamlessly. So I, I think as a community, uh, I do want to have us all acknowledge as we end this year, and we're still going into a new one, uh, calendar wise anyway, really what um, terrific staff we have in our district and appreciate them. And I also have to say our students could not be better in terms of their um, they're managing all of the protocols and safety practices that we have had uh, to keep everyone safe. They've been, they've been terrific. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, questions? No, Mr. Thielman? I just have one question. A question came in to us um, and the person actually reached out to me too as to uh, why today was a half, could you just explain why you made a decision to have ha today be a half day rather than a full day of school? Thank you. I, I've answered a few of those today. Um, well, a couple of reasons. Um, th there is, a, there is a not unanimity, though a majority of our staff um, would prefer to have a remote day than uh, a snow day. When I was looking at this issue back on Monday, I really thought we were going to have a, a delayed opening. Uh, we superintendents and the Commonwealth uh, get um, much more detail than you would even some, you even get on going to the National Weather Service. And it looked like we were maybe having four inches, which is about the cutoff when we have delayed openings or we're just in school. So, in that situation, um, by the time we get in 10 o'clock, that's when DPW does not want us to, I shouldn't say does not want us, but they, they have requested over the years that if we could have a delayed opening at 10. So 
I'm just looking at the sheer number of hours. Many of our teachers, um, while they they teach remotely on Wednesday, it's a half day. There's a lot of nuances to this. Some of our hybrid teachers, unless they were in quarantine, have not been teaching remotely a full day. They've been teaching half days. And so it seemed like a, a, a lot to ask them to organize a remote half day, I mean, a full day. And there's also the issue of, um, what do we want our, do we want our kids on a snow day to be able to get outside and, you know, play? Um, I think that was something that I considered as well. So there was a, a lot of, a lot of things. And of course, I, I got a question today about, well, why not just let the high school have continued um, as it, as it is a, a, um, or it has a remote program. And it came down to equity in the district. Uh, we would be asking some some set of teachers to be um, teaching all day um, and some not. I will say that for the for the four hours for that were um, this morning, teachers did not have a prep and they did not have a lunch. So those were sort of factored into the afternoon. Now, should we change this in the future? I'm definitely open to suggestions. I'm going to get feedback from teachers how it went. Um, I'm, cer I'm certain that I've, I've already gotten feedback from uh, parents. And uh, the next time, maybe we do have a full remote day or uh, maybe we just have a snow day. So that's, that was sort of the reasoning that went into my thinking. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of considerations and I just felt that this was the right call. I know that some districts have had had a full day of remote, some closed completely, and some had an abbreviated schedule. It was all over the map in terms of the state. And I just thought it was the best call for Arlington for today. That's why. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Uh, vote Please approval. Please hold, hold the job description. Okay. Uh, vote approval of minutes, school committee meetings, November 19th, November 20th, and November 24th, 2020. Vote approval of job description director of mathematics and computer science education K-12. So we're gonna pull that one off. So we're just going to vote the uh, one, two, three minutes. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, so the next item is the approval of the job. Uh, point, of order, point of order, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I, I think for today's minutes, you need somebody to move and second that. For today's minutes? Uh, for the uh, for the, for the uh, oh, I for, need a move the consent agenda motion. motion. Yeah, 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 you're right. OK, so let's do that. Does anybody want to make a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Mine is second. second. Job description. Super. All right, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. I'm sorry. What are we? What are we voting on? Uh, we didn't. We. I didn't get a motion for the consent agenda. But oh, okay. We voted. So now uh, we're going to revote it. Yes. You still a yes? All right. Cool. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Still a yes. Good. Mr. Schlickman. Sure. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Absolutely. I am also yes. Twice on those minutes, Ms. Fitzgerald, please note they're the specialist minutes of all time. All right. Uh, job description, Director of Mathematics and Computer Science Education, K-12. Dr. Bode, do you want to, uh, Mr. Hainer, do you want to ask your question about this? Yeah. Uh, first off, uh, number one, it has no salary in it, like the former job descriptions. All our job descriptions usually have a range of salary. That's minor. Is this a replacement for the cur uh, curriculum leader, the mathematics curriculum leader? No, not at okay, all. Go ahead, Mr. Spiegel. I, I had, um, 
I had meant to, to email you all some, uh, an explanation. So I'm glad you pulled it from the consent agenda, Mr. Hayner. Um, it's actually a reflection of what that position has been. And uh, Matt, for many years, in fact, um, as we've increased our computer science program uh, K through 12. So that it, we were just looking to make sure that that the job description was consistent with what the current responsibilities are. And there was a, a reason to do it now that uh, uh, Mr. Coleman uh, would prefer that we do it now rather than wait. So that's the reason. There's no change. Um, the, um, the job, the, the salary range will depend upon triple A because the the, the, we have a formula in the AAA contract for how um, administrators um, that are part of AAA, how their salaries are determined. Going forward, I, it, the hiring agent, which is you, you can hire somebody if they don't meet all the qualifications. I, I, I think it's important that, that this job description, so it doesn't have to be re rewritten in the future, it talks about computer science, yet the uh, qualifications, there's no mention about having any background in computer science. I'm not saying that Matt doesn't have it, but going forward, we'd end up having to rewrite this again. This just is the math curriculum leader's job description with all the adjustments throughout it after the requirements at the beginning. So I, I, I would recommend that you just add those other, some sort of computer science qualifications. You don't have to, it doesn't have to have a degree at this time. You can pick and choose with the person you hire. It's a, good, it's a very good suggestion. Um, what happens with job descriptions, um, small adjustments like that, we will, we will include and as we update them. The reason we're bringing this to you is that it's actually a, a change in title and, um, and, and felt that that, that that is you know something that we do is bring job description to you. I, I don't question his value. I, I value him. I think he's a phenomenal person and everything in, in all the work that everyone does. But you're staying within the AAA contract with regard to salary? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'll support this going forward. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Cardin. I move approval of the job description for the director of math and computer science. Second. Second. Um, great. Any more discussion? Being none, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nicky. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Okay, subcommittee uh, liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Yepi. We met yesterday, we discussed how the FY22 budget is shaping up. And also um, we, Mr. Mason gave us information about enrollment and what we're guessing enrollment could be next year. And all of this was in anticipation of long range planning meeting on coming on Monday. Um, and we will be meeting again fairly soon, hoping to loop Mr. Bowler in to discuss the athletic fees, which have kept coming just up to where we're about to discuss them. And then the athletic director changes. And so then they get passed and we're hoping to um, suss out whether we think we can push it through the goal line. <laughs> um, so that's all. Great. Um, CIAA, Mr. Car uh, sorry, Community Relations, Mr. Hainer. We met a couple of days ago. We uh, discussed, uh, let, let me skip this commu uh, school committee chat for a second. Uh, we had members of CPAC come and uh, talk to us about communication. Uh, Dr. Bodie was there, Mr. Woods, uh, technology person was there, and 
they seem to uh, work out some sort of uh, understanding that they would be in contact with each other to deal with that. Uh, I presented the committee. I hope you all got it uh, a list. It looks fairly overwhelming, 20 school committee chats. Uh, the subcommittee agreed that the trial uh, three, one, three school committee chats we had were very beneficial. Uh, several of them had more people show up than we ever had at the live ones. Um, and uh, one of the people, the participants suggested a fourth meeting. Um, and so I presented, I'm presenting to you tonight a schedule um, of approximately 20 meetings. I will uh, schedule a meeting for the uh, subcommittee sometime in January, and uh, we will assess the fourth meeting that's listed as other. Uh, I'm gonna rely on Ms. Exton to possibly come up with topics or something for communication uh, and uh, go forward. Uh, I, it is my intent, uh, to be present at every one of those meetings. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald has been holding my hand. Hopefully I'll be able to get the, the Zoom meeting together better. I apologize, I was late getting it going the other day. So uh, unless anyone has any questions, I will have uh, work with Karen to send out a doodle to get your input to, uh, for participation on the school committee chats. All right, any questions for Mr. Hainer on that? Okay. Uh, seeing none, um, CIA, Mr. Cardin. Uh, nothing to report this time, thanks. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, no report except that we'll be uh, looking to schedule a meeting uh, early in January. Uh, superintendent search process, Mr. Schlickman. I think we're done. I think we're done. Um, do you, what do we need to do to pull that off of the liaison reports and announcements? Do we need to like dissolve the search subcommittee? No, we, we, we could just uh, leave it off the agenda. It'll expire naturally at the end of the uh, term. Super. All right. So Ms. Fitzgerald, you can remove that from the, um, the list moving forward. Um, High School Building Com Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet January 5th, Tuesday, January 5th at 6 p.m. Uh, liaison reports, announcements, future agenda items. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, two things. One was the getting a report on the survey that went out to families about um, learning this year to date. Um, so hopefully we can get that at our one of our January meetings. The other one, um, uh, is related to the regulations that were passed by DESE just this week on Tuesday regarding live instruction. Um, and because this is a, a regulation, I am going to make a motion for a report rather than just um, relying on the chair to schedule it. Um, we do have to comply with this new regulation by January 19th. So I would like to move that the superintendent, um, so just some, some background in case people didn't see the Globe article or anything else from MESC about it. Uh, this is for the learning time regulations. Uh, the change was to add a definition of live instruction, which is either um, remote, either either synchronous remote instruction or in-person instruction. Um, there's a certain number of hours for live instruction that's now required, um, uh, 40 hours over 10 days for the remote program, 35 hours over 10 days for the hybrid program. So, um, the motion is to um, move, and Karen, I will email this to you. I just typed it out um, earlier in the meeting. Uh, move that the superintendent present uh, the school committee at the January 14th meeting, an analysis of the number of hours of live instruction every 10 days in the hybrid and remote programs, and a plan to become compliant with the new regulations related thereto. Second. Uh, discussion? Mr. Thurman? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to support the motion. On the date, um, wouldn't it be a good idea for the CIA meeting to meet before the 14th to review and discuss it? So maybe January 12th, so you guys can review it? Um, or no, I don't. I don't yeah, I, I defer to Dr. Bodhi. I, I mean, I think either way, but. I've already done the analysis, so if you want okay. to meet. 
Well, the, why don't we just say the 14th, but maybe you guys can just have an, it, 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 try to, it, it's always better if there's a little vetting and conversation by the CIA committee. And if we can get everybody in the room to hear it. So we think about it in advance of a okay. full committee discussion. That's all. So maybe we just have this understanding that it's due the 14th, but the 12th or the 13th, if Dr. Bodhi has a presentation ready, we can have a CAA meeting and everybody can be invited. We can all weigh in or, or get educated before we, because if we mm -hmm. see it just, and what happens sometimes is we see it on the 14th, it's in Novus and there's not a lot of time to react to it. I'd rather have a day or two to react to it. At least I would. I can't speak for anybody else. Mr. Schuckman, did you want to speak on this one? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to support the motion. I think that uh, uh, having the report uh, is, is important. My sense is that we're probably uh, in compliance uh, or close to it. So it, it shouldn't be a, a big deal. Uh, so I, I don't see the need to, unless we need to do something to be in compliance or there's some issue surrounding it, I don't see the need to talk about it uh, before the, we receive the report. Uh, so let me just ask uh, the superintendent, uh, are we in compliance uh, or do we have some work to be done? Elementary level, um, we probably could have the students have another um, asynchronous, I mean, sorry, synchronous um, um, class, probably a special on the two remote days. And we've already started talking about how that um, we could we could have that happen. So the, the discussion's already there. I think that, I think that's something that, that would be important to do anyway. I, I do think though that, um, but we can talk about it in terms of what those numbers look like. But I, but I think one of the things that's happened the elementary uh, this year is that with hand washing, which takes a lot more time with young kids, um, recess time, mass breaks, there's a little bit more non-instructional time in the day than there might be on a regular year. So that, that's what plays a little bit into the numbers on this. Um, okay, th th thank you. In that case, I think it's worthwhile having a CIA meeting just to hash it out yeah. before we go forward. Absolutely. All right, anybody else on this? Uh, Dr. Al Snampy? What about the high school in terms of compliance I'm, um well i guess it does it count as hybrid or does it count as remote it counts as remote we're considered a blended district um so it's it's based on where you were on november 2nd and you know when the high school becomes a hybrid program we we will not have the same requirement for the high school. But even with that, um, in, do, in working through the numbers with Dr. Janger and really looking at in terms of how they define it, which is basically about what a typical student would have in a school day. So I, I think that it's helpful to have this discussion. So pretty much if you have a six and a half hour school day, and with you know some passing time and 22 minutes for lunch, mm -hmm. the rest of it's instructional time. So mm -hmm. if you look at that over the two weeks, it it's uh, you know meets the requirements. Right. I guess I'm thinking it doesn't. To me, it doesn't sound like that's what Desi's doing. So I, I understand we can't. That, change yeah, can, what they said, but I'm just, anyway, okay, so I, I will try and attend the CIA meeting. I'm confused because I'm not sure Desi's, at, if I understood it correctly, that Desi's ask seems reasonable to me, not that that yeah. changes anything. And uh, yeah, okay. So, so for people who are listening who are not, um, 
they have set a, a standard of 35 hours, as, as, as Mr. Cardin said, 35 hours of either in-person or synchronous instruction over two weeks. And um, that is true at the elementary, middle, and high school. But when they look at it, they look at it in terms of a district average. Um, so there, the, the, I don't even know what it would be for the, I have to figure that out, but it's, it's based on a district average. And you, um, and it's the same thing among the schools. So our elementary, maybe it's different other district, but we're pretty uniform in terms of time. Um, both, they, they did a, a snapshot of grade one, four, seven, and 10. So it's not, that's how they approach it. So the Gibbs, because that's a sixth grade school wasn't even in the um, in the in the data collection. I'd be happy to talk about. It. I think we should talk about it in a subcommittee meeting, and uh, and then we can present the report uh, to the public. I don't think that that I'm not sure exactly when the data will be made public. Uh, that's that clear. To me, anywhere I haven't, told, I haven't been told. I just know it's soon. Okay, so my my comment on this is I support uh, it being looked at in CIA. I will need to see um, like charts with math and numbers and stuff. Um, that that that'll that's that's how it's going to work for for me to understand um, where we're at and where we're going. So I'm assuming we're going to get some math and numbers and charts. Charts. Okay, good charts. So many charts. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, so I would just say, just before we all go away and get, go on break, and, and I think getting away and going on break and not meeting as a school committee or in subcommittee for th three, three weeks or so is good for the district, good for everybody. Um, but I do think, Mr. Cardin, it would be great if you could sort of get a date, work with Dr. Bodhi and, and Ms. Tassoni, get a date that works for everybody, the 12th or the 13th, and we can all try to be on a call for CIA and get it on our calendars early. Great. So can we vote on Mr. Cardin's motion? Um, super. No more discussion? Great. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, so um, Dr. Bodie or Dr. McNeil, will one of you connect with Ms. Fitzgerald about the panorama survey that Mr. Cardin asked about? And the other one that I was wondering about was the, the curriculum audit, if we were gonna see a readout from that at some point or when when is that a January thing or a February thing, um, when we might see that as an agenda item. Um, let me, uh, why don't I get back to you on that? Okay, so that's great. We, we can do that presentation. Super. <laughs> Any other future agenda items was hopping tonight, guys. Uh, oh, and Ms. Exton has one too. All right. Yes, Ms. Exton. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to follow up on the Board of Health um, mm -hmm. request that you had made. Yes, yeah, so I heard back from them that they are happy to meet with us in the new year and that they would provide us with some dates, um, which I don't, I think they wanted to set a date in the new year. So um, I will uh, follow up with them. I think it makes sense. I, I, I didn't, I think the evening is not usually great um, for them, um, but I, I, I share your interest in that meeting and they are happy to meet with us, which I think is great. Um, it's just going to be setting a, pinning down a date. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Martin, Dr. Yes. Um, it may be that you might want to put it in a subcommittee because you're correct. Uh, they would prefer to uh, meet with the committee or, or a subset of the committee um, during the day, if that can be arranged. We, I, I told them I'm happy to meet with them anytime. So we will sort that out. Um, but I, it's helpful that it came up tonight because then I can go back to them and say that it's 
you know, we still obviously want to do it. So that's great. Thank you, Ms. Exton. We can, uh, Mr. Thielman. We can just add it to the CIA meeting that Mr. Cardin is going to organize on the 12th or the 13th. Yeah, we sure could. We could meet all day, five hour meeting. No. Is Jeff on that subcommittee? I just, no. But I, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, I figured that. That's why. Jeff volunteers uh, everybody. I would, no, but I always go to those if I can. Okay. All right. We're going to have so many meetings. We're going to take a few weeks off of meetings and then we're going to have a lot. It's almost a German time, right on time. Absolutely. I, I'm, I've got a goal and I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to make it to it. All right. Uh, anything else for future agenda items? That was a solid 15 minutes. Oh. Nobody. All right. And we do not have executive session tonight, even though it's, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't need it. Um, so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. move. Wow. <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm for that. Um, Second. Great. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schuchman. Yes. Mr. Heener. Yes. And um, I am also yes. So happy new year to everybody. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy, happy new year. Um, happy you holidays. Year. Be safe. Be safe. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night.